There it goes. That's the sound on. Well, I guess we're just muted for the first part. There's a little review from yesterday anyway. Correct answer. Hey, are we going to get a gold card on this one? See how good at listening we are? D. Torques tell me about angular acceler acceleration. Forces tell me about linear acceleration. So if the forces are balanced, it cannot be accelerating. D is the correct answer there. All right, so now we got to think about a situation where there's a beam being supported. How should we draw the forces at a hinge? Okay, so when we draw the forces at a hinge, we typically draw an X and a Y value. But based on the picture, it's up to you to figure out is the X value to the left or the right? Is the Y value up or down? And so the example we have here, Kind of looks like this. And the question is, which direction am I applying a force with my hand? Am I pulling it? Am I pushing it? Am I lifting up or pulling down on it at this point? One way people use to solve this is they think about what would happen if I let go or if that wall disappeared. Which direction would that point I'm holding on to move? And I have to be applying a force opposite the direction it would move if I released it. So try and think about that. Which way would it go? Nevin, you got a solution? All right, so let's think about it. Let's give it a try. Let's see what happens. So if I release it, which way is it going to go? All right, you ready? So it looks like it went to the right and up. So that means I must have been applying a force down and to the left. And so the correct answer is D. The part I was holding on to. No, it went right. Want me to do it again, Durst? Really? Oh, now I got my hand switched. Yep. Rewind the video and watch it again, Durst. You ready? You watching this point right here? From this point right here, I'm just going to move my finger then. Where did it go initially? Alright. Which one's possible? Is it or isn't it possible?
All right, correct answer. We're half-ish, right? <laughs> okay, so it's yes for both of them. So let's think about some examples. So the one that is probably the easiest to comprehend is if I drop this, if I just release it here from rest and drop it, is it going to rotate? No. no. Is it accelerating? Yes. So in that case, is there a net torque? No. Is there a um, net accelerate net force though? Yes, so we have translational equilibrium, I'm sorry, rotational equilibrium and not translational equilibrium. So the second answer is yes, that's just me dropping something. So we narrowed it down to A and C. Now the example that we get for, so that was this case here. So if I just drop it, I got mg. So the sum of the torques equals zero, um, but the sum of the forces does not equal zero. All right. Now, imagine I was looking down on like a, a sheet of ice and I put a stick on that sheet of ice and I went ahead and I pushed 10 newtons one way and 10 newtons the other way. In this case, if I chose my axis of rotation right here at the center, uh, the sum of the torques is also equal to zero. How about the sum of the forces? Equal to zero or not equal to zero in this case? equal zero. So both are in equilibrium. Now let's say I took those two forces and I just moved them to the side a little bit. So I moved my 10 newtons over here and I moved my other 10 newtons over here. My axis rotation is still here. Are my forces still balanced? The sum of my forces is still equal to zero. Is my torque going to be balanced? No, because now both are trying to do what type of Torque, they're both trying to rotate it clockwise. They're both putting in a negative torque, so the sum of the torques here is not equal to zero. Okay. So you don't have to have both in equilibrium. You can have just one or the other in equilibrium. Okay. All right, open up your e-text, page 327. We're going to go ahead and do number 42 on that page. So we're going to start to bring some angles into these torques. So we had a static equilibrium problem we just did at the start of the hour where everything was perpendicular already. So now we're going to see what do we do when we have things that are at angles. Okay. So get to page 327. We're looking at number 42. I'll draw a picture on the board here while you get there. All right, here we go. So what forces are acting on that beam in that picture? There's gravity. Where does gravity act? At the center, right? So 150 newtons is the weight of the beam. So we have that horizontal beam, weight of 150 newtons, and its center of gravity is at center. First, make a free body diagram then find the tension in the cable and the horizontal and vertical components from the pivot on the wall. So I have my pivot over here. There's also like a container hanging off the end. The container is pulling down with a weight of 300 newtons. And I also have my tension off in this direction. Now they did tell us that this was a three, four, five triangle up here. 
So that makes this angle 37 degrees. And I can then say that the sine of 37 degrees is equal to 3 fifths. And the cosine of 37 degrees, it's not exactly 37 by the way, um, is equal to 4 fifths. Okay. And I do have forces from the wall. Durst, do you think you can tell me which direction the X component of that force is acting? Is the wall pushing out or holding the beam to the wall? What do you think? So you think that if we remove the wall, the beam would move away? Okay. Someone want to help them out? What do we think? Is the beam holding it to the wall or pushing it away from the wall? Pushing it away. What gives it away that it's pushing it away from the wall? What's the tension doing? Pulling it toward the wall. So what does the wall have to do? Counter the tension. Okay. Now, the vertical ones may be a little tougher to think about. So let me give you an idea on how to do this vertical one. Imagine I chose my axis of rotation right here on the end, where I'm holding my fingers. What is the beam's weight trying to do? It's trying to rotate it this way, right? So what's the wall got to do to counter that? It's, it's got to be an apply a force up. Now, if you ever, for whatever reason, don't do so well at this. Right, Caleb? You don't do so well at this? Yeah. What, would, what would happen if you chose, hey, I think it's, you know, fx is to the left. When you solve for fx, Caleb, you're just going to get a negative number. That negative number is just telling you the direction is wrong. Okay? So there's two possibilities when you get a negative number. One, you did everything right in your free by diagram, but you messed something up in your calculations, you're in radian mode, something like that. The other option is you messed up a direction in your free body diagram. So you got to figure that out. Okay? All right. In that case, the magnitude of the force will be right, just not the direction. All right. So let's go ahead and start thinking about what we're going to do here. So is this accelerating? Nope. So that tells me that the sum of the forces in the x is equal to 0 and the sum of the forces in the y is equal to 0. Is this angularly accelerating? So that means the sum of the torques is zero. Is it rotating? Nope. All right. So that means I can choose my axis where I want. Do you see those three things we just went through? Is it accelerating? No. All right. The sum of the forces is zero. Is it angularly accelerating? No. Therefore, the sum of the torques is zero. Is it rotating? No. Therefore, I get to choose where my axis of rotation is. Okay. All right. So, in order to do the sum of the forces in the x and y, I do have to resolve something into components. So that's this one here. So this was 37 degrees. So I'm going to have t cosine of 37, t sine of 37. So what I'd like you to do is go ahead and generate a x and y equation from our free body diagram. So go ahead and do that. Look at that free body diagram. Identify what forces are in the x, which ones are in the y. Generate an equation. Alright, so in the x direction I have f of x minus t cosine 37 equals 0. If you chose your x direction wrong, it might show up here that you did it wrong because there's no way you can put two positive numbers together and get a um, 0 or put two negative numbers together and get a 0 unless you picked a direction wrong. The y direction, a little less clear, so I have t sine of 37 plus fy 
minus 150 minus 300 equals zero. Okay. Torque equation. All right, so to do a torque equation, we do need to choose an axis of rotation. So I'm going to go ahead and choose my axis of rotation. I like left points and I like points that remove variables I don't know. Because I'm asked to find tension and I look at my x direction, in order to find tension I got no fx. I look at my y direction, in order to find tension I got no fy. So when I get to my torque equation, guess what I want to get rid of? I want to get rid of fx and I want to get rid of fy. Okay? Fy, if I choose my axis of rotation there, will not produce any torque. How about fx? What if I would have chose my axis of rotation maybe here? Is fx going to produce any torque? No, because it's not perpendicular. Okay. And if I choose my axis rotation here, is T cosine 37 going to produce any torque? No, because it's not perpendicular to that beam. All right. So what I would like you to do now is we're looking at this. This one is going to produce a counterclockwise torque, clockwise torque, clockwise torque. Generate a torque equation here. Use that free body diagram to generate a torque equation. So we got to do force times the distance from the axis of rotation to where the force acts. And you should end up with an equation that looks kind of like this. So T sine 37 times 4 minus 300 times 4 minus 150 times 2. All right. All we got to do now is a bunch of algebra. So our first step is we're going to solve for T once we know T. That's part A. Then we can plug T in, solve for Fy. Plug T in, solve for Fx. That's part B. So let's go ahead and do that. So we're going to solve for tension. So tension times the sine of 37, which is 3 fifths times 4 minus, okay, so 4 times 300 is negative 1,200 minus another 300, so minus 1,500. Move it to the other side. Positive 1,500. Okay. Let me start moving some stuff around here. So I got 1,500 divided by 3 and 4 and multiplied by 5. So 625 newtons will be our tension. Go ahead, take that 625, plug it in to these other two equations. Okay. So I'm solving for Fy now. So I have Fy is equal to, combine those together, 450. So I have 450 minus T, which was 625 times sine of 37, which was 3 fifths. So. 375, so Fy is 75 newtons. So most of our load is being held by that tension, 625. That wall hinge doesn't have to be all that strong in this scenario. And then lastly, we just got to solve for Fx. So Fx is going to be 625 times 4 fifths. Oops, four fifths. So, 500. Newtons. But, 
if I was going to do this, I'd make sure that my wall could support that 500 newtons of push on it, right? Because if the wall is pushing on the beam this way, that means the beam is pushing it on it. 500 newtons, you wouldn't want that beam to go into the wall. Okay. All right, get out that half sheet you picked up on the way in. We're going to do that one next. All right, the half sheet. So when you look at this half sheet, you'll notice that our beam is at an angle instead of horizontal. So the last two we've done, we have horizontal beams. This one's at an angle, okay? There's also another little trick on this one that I'm gonna show you. All right, so let's draw it out, see what we get here. All right, so I have my beam, something like this. It's at an angle of 45 degrees. There's anything I know about drawing a free body diagram, big is better, right? And then I have a tension acting this way that makes an angle of 30 degrees, all right? So that's my tension. I'm actually going to draw that a different color, I think. I'm going to draw my forces in a green. All right, so I do have tension acting on it. T. What other forces are acting on my beam? Gravity. Where's gravity act? At the center. So I got M1G. The mass of the beam, it says, is 45 kilograms. So M1 is... 45 kilograms, and then I put a big old mass off the end, 225 kilograms, right off the M. So I'll have that as M2G. All right. And we are asked to find the tension in the string, the normal force from the ground, and the horizontal force from that pivot point. Okay, so that means there's an X and a Y force down here. So there's a normal force because it's on a surface, so there's got to be a normal force here if it's resting on a surface like this. Which direction do you think Fx is, Durst? Do you think that the ground is holding the beam this way or the ground is pulling the beam this way? What do you think? Nope. What's pulling it to the left already? Tension. tension. So if tension's pulling it to the left, guess what the ground's got to do? Yeah. Fx. All right. Is this beam accelerating? No. Therefore, the sum of the forces in the x direction is zero. Is the, and the sum of the forces in the y direction is zero. Is this beam angularly accelerating? Therefore, the sum of the torques is equal to zero. Is it rotating at all? Nope. Therefore, I get to choose my axis of rotation. All right. So let's start doing this. So to generate an x and a y force, what do I need to do? I need to resolve any forces that aren't in the x or the y. So I see tension is not in the x or the y. So I'm going to have to go ahead and resolve tension into components. So there's going to be a component this way and a component this way. And this angle right here is my 30 degrees. So I have T sine of 30, T cosine of 30. And that's because this angle is 30. All right. So now I should be able to generate my X and my Y equations. So let's go ahead and do that. So in the x, we have fx minus t cosine 30. In the y, I have normal force minus t sine 30 minus m1g minus m2g.
Now we get to a torque equation. The torque equation requires that we draw a free body diagram, and on our free body diagram, we have to label distances. Do they tell me the length of this beam? No. So what we do in this case, if they do not tell you the length of the beam, what we're going to do is we're going to call the beam a length L. Okay? So the whole thing's a length L, so how far is it from the bottom to the point where gravity acts? L over 2. Half L, whatever you want to call it. And how about this other part? L over 2 as well, yeah? All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to call the total length L and I'm going to do everything in fractions of L. And you're going to see why we're going to do this in a second. Okay? All right, so now I've got to create a torque equation. I'm trying to find tension. So if I look in my x direction, in order to find tension, I've got to know fx. In order to find tension, I've got to know normal force. So where should I choose my axis rotation so I can find tension and not have to worry about fx and normal force? Choose it someplace where fx and normal force won't produce any torque. So that means I would choose my axis rotation right here. However, is mg perpendicular to this beam? No. How about m2g? No. How about tension? No. So what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to go ahead and resolve some of this into components. Think about the inclined plane when you resolve these into their components. All right. So this angle here is 45 degrees. So we have m1g cosine of 45, m2g cosine of 45. This is why we drew our free body diagram big. How about this angle right here? What angle is that going to be? So if this angle is 45 here, that means this total angle is 45 here. And if this one's 30, this one is 15. Perfectly drawn to scale, as you can see there. And so then this component here is T sine of 15. So at this point, if you wanted to redraw that so you get a little better idea of what the heck is going on for your torque equation, um, I have M1G cosine 45. M2G cosine 45, and tension sine 15. And I have L over 2, L over 2. So what I'd like you to do is go ahead and generate a torque equation for me. Figure out which ones are positive torques, which ones are negative torques. And do force times the distance from the axis rotation to the location of the force being applied. I'm actually going to have to write this down a level or something here. Those are both negatives. Should get something like this. Now what do you notice about all the terms? They all have what in common? An L. So what happens to that L? Cancels out, yeah. 
So we get rid of that L, and now we can solve for tension because we know M1, we know M2. We can solve for tension. So let's go ahead and do that. So tension times the sine of theta, oops, 15 in this case, is going to equal M1 G times cosine of 45 times 1 half plus M2G cosine 45 times 1. You can factor out a G cosine 45 if you want and then divide the sine 15 over so I have tension is equal to G cosine 45 times M1 over 2 plus M2 all divided by the sine of 15. Once we have that tension number calculated, we can go ahead and plug it in and find Fx. We can plug it in up here and solve for normal force. So let's go ahead and start typing that in, see what we get. 9.8 times the cosine of 45 times 45 over 2 plus 225 all divided by the sine of 15. All right. Store that number. So I'm going to need it later. Something like 1959. What are the units on that thing, on that tension? Newtons. Yeah, Newtons. I multiply that by the cosine of 30. Kendra, you good? You got it all typed out, ready to go? Oh, okay. Times x, and then we got to do x cosine 30 plus 45 times 9.8 times 225 times 9.8. Oops. Plus. So we should get 302 for fx. And for the normal force, we should get 710. There we go. So what do you think the tough part of this one was? Making sure you're resolving components correctly, and then knowing that little trick about the L. Those two things, you got to be persistent. You got to be meticulous in solving these, okay? All right, and that's it. What'd you say?